Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining a session where I'm going to talk a little bit about ways that you can actually connect those silos of information in real time by using data virtualization. So I'm Becky Smith. I'm a product marketing manager for Denodo based here in the UK. So hopefully the next half hour or so will, will be of some interest. So, you know, there was a little while ago when I was a bit younger and didn't have so much gray hair where actually life was a lot simpler. We didn't have so many silos of data or trenches of data. The whole process of gathering data, whether it was into analytics or reporting or out to other systems, generally seemed much easier. You know, there was some, some ETL that went out, there then might be some staging and then into data lakes. But over time, the whole landscape of data has got a lot, lot uglier. You know, our data isn't all nicely sitting within our four walls and with our environment. We've still certainly got core systems, legacy systems. Some, in some cases, some have been running for so many years that we're just too scared to actually touch or move them because if we did try to migrate them, we're not sure what we're migrating. But there's those core business systems on premise. But increasingly, we're seeing that people are moving into a combination of having some cloud applications. Maybe their CRM or HR systems are up there. But also, there's this thirst for more data and more information to actually gain those actionable insights or actually to find ways to do things like monetize the data we're collecting as an organization, which means we're needing to bring in things like the streaming data. Maybe if we're a manufacturer, it's bringing in that information off the plant. Maybe we want to bring in social data for brand awareness, understand what our customers are saying about us, or there's all that other sort of unstructured document data that we're collecting that is valuable. And then on top of that, we've got things like governance coming into place. I'm not going to go on much about GDPR because I think it still makes us all shudder. But also security, data privacy, lots of areas around there that are actually kind of mattering more and more to us every day in business. And we're really much more complex world of having to integrate the data, a lot more going on around data discovery, actually looking, parsing, refining that data onto different types of users. You know, the data scientist wasn't around that long ago. We've now got our data scientists, our analysts who are needing to consume who a lot of the time are right now challenged and spending up to 80% of their time actually hunting for the data they need. And then there's the fit for purpose data that we need to try and create, all of which is really a challenge as we're trying to really go through, create those actionable insights that are gonna drive those better business outcomes. So really, it is a big challenge. We've all got multiple systems. I doubt if I ask the question, has anyone in this room only got one source of data? I doubt anyone's hand would go up. But also, there's challenges with this. I think anyone who's in the IT world, you're challenged with more and more by requests to bring more data integration, add more data in, which really forces you down to kind of knee-jerk point to point to meet the needs of the business. And often, it's just taking too long to get the data to the business, which then means we do get an element of those mavericks and, and cowboys. <coughs> Excuse me. So what can we do about it? This is really where, if we can find a way to create a data abstraction layer that can sit across these many and diverse sources of data, this will actually give us a way to have a single repository. It might be a virtual lake or a marketplace onto our data that we can not only make sure people have got a consistent view, but also really get to the point where we can bring the data in real time to the users. And to do this, data virtualization is an architecture or is, is a solution to the problem by allowing you to connect to disparate data sources, regardless of what that data is, whether it's on-premise, in the cloud, a mixture, whether it's very structured data down to very unstructured data. And it allows you to actually connect to those sources, then combine those sources. And if you think of a way like ETL, 
you can extract that data, you can then do all the transformations that you would do in an e-tail type process, but we're not actually landing it somewhere. It's a virtual environment that is giving you a consistent environment on top of those silos of data, bringing them together, so your various data consumers, whether it's scientists, analysts, operational reporting, or even out into applications, can actually consume that data in a consistent way with important things like governance and lineage in place, but also the security, with actually being able to do things like manage the resources, make sure I'm not hitting those underlying systems too hard as I'm working on them. So it's really a way of being able to bring those silos together. And I'm going to explore this in, in a little, little more detail in a number of, of kind of solutions that come out of this that can really help you get over the fact that we are in this more complex world. And we really can't just keep replicating all the data. You know, more and more warehouses, marts, whatever. I know a lot of us have gone down the route of putting our data into data lakes and now finding we're slightly challenged about how do we get that back out and combine it with our other data sources. So really, data virtualization can give you a way of connecting those silos of information and put it in the right context for the consumers. So the first way of looking at this is a logical data warehouse. And it's been around for a little while ago. Gartner started talking about it back in about 2012. <coughs> and what this really, the logical data warehouse, is a way of bringing those sources together. And here's just the first of, of, of a couple of examples to kind of bring it to life and how data virtualization can help connect those silos. So you might be in a situation where you've got warehouses stored in a number of different, these are just some examples of the type of sources we can connect to, whether they're on premise or whether they're in the cloud. But then you also perhaps, this might be an example that could, could work with maybe you're looking at total sales over time by, by geog over the last two years by geography. So you need to bring in some kind of, if you like, live data from the CRM system. And with data virtualization, you're able to map and join these different sources of data together so that you can actually then surface those results up, but without actually having to persist that data out to yet another data store. And with a lot of optimization and security, which I'll talk a little bit about more in a minute. Another example might be where you're looking at the scenario again where due to mergers and acquisitions, or maybe you started life with very different departmental type solutions, but actually there's a need to bring that data from those different departmental or merger situations together to provide that holistic picture. And again, data virtualization will allow you to create, join that data, create those mappings without yet again having to physically move and land that data again. <coughs> Excuse me. And a third example is really, again, similar of, of looking around a horizontal partitioning of the data, of being able to bring together, perhaps we've got our current sales, but we've archived off into maybe um, a hive structure, a lot of our historical data, but there's still need to bring that back for analysis reasons. And again, data virtualization allows you to bring those data sources and map them up together so they can be then used for business reporting and analysis purposes. An example of this is a, a customer of ours who, based in Germany, they're a large manufacturer. They've got a number of sites in the UK as well. And they were really challenged with the business of being able to work smarter. And they've built this big data analytics framework to really make sure that they can get to all the data they need so they can make just-in-time decisions. And this comes from warehouse data, but also they're bringing in data actually from their energy supplier because they're wanting to optimize some of their factory lines as they're going in production. So with what's coming off also with the machine data. So they're using a combination of historical data plus the streaming data, creating this environment in, in within the data virtualization so they can put out operational reporting dashboards and scores. So they've got the operational reporting so they can check stuff on hourly, daily, 
but also have a dashboard on the factory floor so people can see whether there's slack or there's over usage and can instantly change and move those things. But what they've been able to do by now having this single stream is they've really simplified the consumption. Also, as new sources of data comes in, perhaps as new processes stream in, they can bring those in much more quickly because they're not having to do complex ETL process. It's a matter of just mapping it in the virtualization layer. And it's really bringing them speed, speed and agility into their environment. <coughs> Excuse me. And similar with Autodesk, again, multiple sources of data, which they're already streaming some of that data into an enterprise data lake, coming from structured device data as well. But they also have their batch, their traditional warehouse and data marts. But they need to combine that data together to be able to actually put out into the various reporting solutions they do, plus also some, they're starting to monetize data out, actually out into some of their suppliers and customers. And what they've been able to do is to bring in things like a single layer of security. So actually make the security and governance much easier and simpler. Um, also reducing the replication that they're going through, cutting back on the ETL that they're having to do, and really getting to one point of the truth managed in a, a single way, but giving them that flexibility too. So, you know, something of dealing with those silos is to look at the concept of bringing in a logical data warehouse. And really, you know, it augments what you've already got in the way of maybe you've gone the lake group, maybe you've got your various marts and, and warehouses. And actually bring those with a semantic layer where you can stitch things together very quickly, have that agility to move at the pace that the business actually needs to move at. <coughs> so, pardon me. It's kind of one of the questions probably on top of mind for a lot of you. If I'm doing all this logically in an abstract way, what about the performance and the speed? You know, what am I actually pulling across the network? So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about that. And one of the key things about Denodo data virtualization is having dynamic query optimization. And actually, what does that mean? So if you think of simple traditional federation engines, which traditionally use quite a naive data strategy. And again, it might be that simple example of total sales by customer country over the last two years. With the data that I've actually got sitting in my warehouse, plus also my, my past history that's been put out into my lake, I've got my customer data actually in an Oracle system sitting there to bring that data in to actually run that query would be about 600 million rows of data that is going to take about 20 minutes and an awful lot of network traffic. But by actually starting to bring in a virtual and abstract layer with data virtualization, I'm actually able to harness the dynamic query optimization. And because of knowledge that I've got about the systems underneath, I can actually push down some of these queries, the groups that I need to do. So I'm actually reducing the amount of network traffic, A, which is a good thing on the network, but also actually brings back the results much, much faster, especially, for example, when I've got a the teaser box with spare capacity on it. I can push the processing down to that. And before anyone goes, of like, oh, what are you going to do to my systems underneath their operational? We've got a lot of tuning and, and monitoring in place to allow throttling, et cetera, on, on core operational systems so it can meet your needs. And then the third example is actually, perhaps you're in an environment where you're using things like Cloudera and Parler or Presto or Spark, that we can actually further now optimize those queries by harnessing that processing, that MPP capability that's there and really start to bring down the result to about 13 seconds. So we're not only in a position where we're able to span across those silos without having to bring in whole new architectures and storage, but actually get the rapid results that the, the business is demanding. <coughs> so I think what's important, you can bring in this logical layer and gain really good performance within it by using things like advanced dynamic optimization, minimize that network, 
traffic, leverage actually some of the power of the data sources that you've got there that might not be fully utilized, but also use things depending on the scale of your data like MPP processing. And then also there's an opportunity where it makes sense. Maybe there's some data that's constantly reused throughout the day that you can actually start to build incremental caches that in their, their own way are secure as well. So that's talking about the speed. Security and governance, again, that's another important thing. And I don't think there's any conversation now today at the moment that doesn't start getting into security, governance, and, and making sure that's adhered across the business. So, you know, to look at this, we've generally got these silos, this plethora of systems, with a whole range of different security models out there. And individually managing all those can be a challenge when you're looking at combining a data and bringing it together for analytics, for those actionable insights. And you know, it can be a challenge as new requirements come in, having to go and tweak things in all these different systems in this spaghetti jungle that we've got in our environment. <coughs> so again, pardon me, this is where you can actually, with by having a virtual layer, abstract that data source security up into the virtual layer and provide, in essence, what is a single data model out to the consumers. So this can be that traditional kind of group role-based access to the data on a need basis. You know, across our business, different users' needs have different requirements to the data, also different permissions. And it takes away the need to manage all that siloed, siloed security processes that were going on and hides away the complexity of the different security models, the different maturities of the data. And importantly as well, there's monitoring all the way so you can see what's being used and, and by whom. And also the fact that we can integrate with existing authorization authorization systems that you have in place, such as LDAP, or it could be SQL Server single sign-on. And then also bringing in, because you're coming in in that common layer, you've really got the governance there of a single point of being able to see who is coming in and being able to monitor who is using what data, when they've used it, and how they've used it. Because the abstract data virtualization layer is actually able to track and monitor that information. And that can be useful for a number of reasons. You know, maybe there's an essence of some warehouse data needs to be offloaded, but you're not sure exactly who's using what at the top end. Again, this virtual layer will allow you to do that to see whether you really need to start to do something with some of those siloed data sources. Also, it really helps of making sure that there's compliance with those corporate policies. You know, more and more, and depending on our industry, either corporate or regulatory policies, by having a common and consistent layer across everything, you're actually able to bring in, have that, also have the auditing and monitoring. So if somebody does ask who's seen what, what have they been able to get to, you have actually be, can actually deliver that in a very succinct way. And importantly, it's on the fly, as they're actually somebody's running a report at the top end or it's going out into an application, those rules are actually enforced at that time. <coughs> and this can be important in a hybrid environment. I know there's a lot of people here. How many of you are in a journey of moving a lot of your core systems applications into the cloud? I can see there's a few people, hands up and nodding. And, you know, again, that's probably bringing in some challenge to your organization as you've got this combination of legacy, new systems and, and coming in. And again, more of those different security models. And again, with the virtual, having the virtual layer there, you're able to bring those new silos of, of data together and actually bring that model across. So as you transition, and it really means that you can use in your new cloud sources the same security mechanisms and access controls that you're using for your legacy premise sources. So it's giving you that chance as you're moving to really remove some of the challenges that you'll face with new mechanisms, new areas, because you've got this mapped across in, 
in the virtual layer. And the use case of this is <coughs> a Syrian who are customers. And you know, one of their big things is really around having data protection privacy as they've grown as an organization, largely in the US, but they've expanded across across the globe, especially into Europe and you know the lands of GDPR, but also some of the sovereignty rules in places like Australia, they really learned very quickly that they had to find a way to manage all those security constraints and geographical constraints, um, whether it's down to you know, PII, personal information protection, GDPR here, but also perhaps departmental restrictions. You know, someone in marketing can't see all the information about individuals that somebody in HR could, for example. And you know, in their environment, they also have got a lot of new systems coming in through merger and acquisition. They've got a number of different code bases and things coming in there. And you know, really what they were wanting to be able to do is to do that discovery, correlation, and enable predictive analytics across the business and provide services out to their consumers and users, but making sure that they're staying safe within that security environment. So that was their kind of challenge. And <coughs> so actually to meet that challenge, what they've done is they've actually bought in virtual layer, both on premise with some of their traditional sources, but also within their cloud environment. They happen to be in the AWS environment to bring that, put that security in place, as well as the combining of the data, whether it's going out to BI or whether it's actually feeding out to applications that their customers are using. So they're confident now that they're able to easily control that security across the whole infrastructure, but from a single point. They're managing that security within the Denote environment on the cloud. They're also able to keep that separation of data where they need to, especially where particular regional and local governments come in. And importantly, provide the audits when requested or needed without having to run through hoops. And as their business involves and change, bring in new systems, new areas, new geographies into the environment. And I think what's important is within the data virtualization platform, governance has been, if you like, pervasive all the way through for us. It's something we've managed for, for a long time. And the important thing is users come in and they can inspect through a catalog front end, a user front end, search and find the data combinations that they may want to use, understand what that data is. We also have data lineage in place, which really helps the users understand where the data's come from, builds a trust in the data, see what transformations it's been through, but also to help the architects building out this virtual layer understand the consequences of changing things lower down in the environment, combinations, calculations, et cetera, and make sure that they can propagate the right changes very easily. So the lineage is very easy, very graphical to see whether you're coming in from a user view or you're, you're coming in, and people can actually trace the view where they're coming in, see actually what's happening with that data, including tracing what's happened with calculating data that might be coming from multiple sources and very visual. And again, the same thing of how is something used? So it may be that there's a requirement to change something lower down in the pie, but actually if you change that, that might impact elsewhere. So it's important before you put those changes in place that you can, you can actually analyze what the impact would be of making that change. And again, this presentation will be available for download after the event. So I know I can see a few people taking photos but feel free. So I think important, a single entry point for both security and governance. Actually being able to do a way of, as we go through this transition into the cloud, more complex data infrastructures, it's not just all inside our, our four walls and in our basements, that we can have that single point of control, either within our cloud or our on-premise data. But actually having things like that catalog search, both help IT and help end users search what they find for. Having the catalog that's actually built up with meaningful business descriptions. So when perhaps people from finance and people from 
marketing, this is my world, are arguing about the budget overspends towards the end of the year, that we're singing from actually the same song sheet when we get there. We've used the same data as we build up our analysis, saving some of those perhaps frictions and challenges within the business, but also making sure perhaps as I'm analyzing data, I'm using the right data to start off with. I mean, I know over the years I fall into the trap of I thought I was using the right thing, but it turned out I wasn't. And then really having that impact analysis around if I make changes, what's going to be the impact through the ecosystem? And then kind of key, everyone wants it faster and quicker. <coughs> I know lots of ways there's been a promise out there. I worked in, in the BI industry for a very long time and we're kind of promising, you know, we'll be able to give it to the users, they can just get on with it, IT's headache is over. And I can see a few smiles in the room there. But, you know, reality is a lot of BI tools, even Excel for some users, is really designed for analysts or, or power users. There are those communities who are happy out there wrangling, cleansing data, creating complex calculations. But there's other users where it's a step too far. You know, there's people who don't want to or don't have the capability or the time to do that. But what they want to be able to do is to find a way where they can quickly use and find the data they need that's already got the calculations in place that they need so they can make sure that they can pick and choose the right entities to use for. Understand where the data come from and also under came from and also understand how that data has been manipulated on its journey up to what they're using. So we like to talk about self-service with guardrails, and I apologize for Hugh Jackman, that's just my personal weakness. Um, and really finding a way to break down those silos, break down those business challenges, and actually to be able to, to build an environment where we can put data out, not just for the data wranglers and cowboys, but for the business community. Actually create a common semantic layer, <coughs> have those pre-integrated, pre-calculated services. Think of data marts, but virtual data marts focused for the finance community or the sales community. But still, within that same layer, be able to give the cowboys, in the nicer sense of the word, that ability to get in and do what they need to do with the data. And this comes from the Enterprise Management Associates, who really say to do this, you need to have connectivity to all those silos and sources, but actually have that very flexible modeling layer and a semantic layer on top for the end users. So whether they're line of business, external users, maybe you're making data available to customers or suppliers um, or providers, be it the analysts or scientists, is having a way to actually do that. And that's something with virtualization that the likes of Indiana University in the States have been able to do. They really wanted to find a way to bring data together so they had a sense of what were the optimal courses they should be running in the university, also the way of having a good map from an HR perspective, bringing in better intelligence about their student communities as well. And they had a number of different data sources, some coming in through web services, they had data up in the cloud in Redshift, they had a lot of data in flat files where they're kind of analyzing past exam results, warehouses, et cetera. And what they've done is actually build this agile delivery tier, this semantic layer that's come in that's really allowing them now to attach that data, whether it's in the HR side or faculty research that's going on, to try and work out what courses they should be running. And they've got their instances coming in there and then feeding out to, actually they're then actually putting some of the data out in, into storage but it's going out for a lot of analytical reporting uses, but they're also putting it out into decision support applications in real time. But with a searchable data dictionary, they're comfortable that the users have got access to the right data in the right place and securely. They can do mask the data that should be kept, kept sensitive. You know, there's elements, you don't want personal information about the students when you're analyzing just course models. So they're building that round and through. 
So really, there's a lot that you can do, not only break down those silos by connecting all those disparate data sources together, but actually look at creating optimal delivery, actually get those fast delivery times, <coughs> bring in the security into your environment, but manage it in a single common semantic layer. Do the governance, even if it's needing to, if where you're needing to mask down to a cell level, but you're able to do it in a way because it's a semantic layer that's very agile and very fast. So with a lot of use cases, you can actually bring up and bring across to the business in a matter of a few weeks or, or months, but also with the flexibility because you can bring in new sources, retire old ones as you move, that you've got the flexibility for change. And I think change is probably the biggest constants for us all in the, in the 21st century. And also reduce some of those integration costs. You know, trying to integrate those silos by feeding data or having to yet again move data. If you can actually reduce those, actually reduce the need for some of those quite resource intensive and expensive ETL processes. You've got an agility, but then also being able to bring in that real time or just in time information. You know, we all want everything faster and quicker. But ultimately, that can enable those business decisions that will help the business react more quickly. So ultimately, that's what I wanted to cover this afternoon. Apologies for being a bit croaky. And just in the last, I think we've got a couple of minutes left of whether there are any questions. If not, do feel free to, to visit us on the stand as well. Thank you. Any questions? No, cool. I know there's someone at the back there with a the mic, if anyone does have any. Cool. With, with that, thank you very much for your time. And uh, enjoy the rest have of the conference. And if you do want to download the slides, they will be available after the event, so you can download them. So thank you. Ladies.